girl who wanted me so badly to solve the logistic case in there. Unless that's her under the hat. No, that's not her. Well, I guess we can't have class then. Alright. Okay. So, too bad. I lied. Maybe you should watch the movie. Um, okay. So we were talking about logistic equations, uh, which is a model of population growth. It's not really just population growth, just like the second order linear differential equations are not just uh, models of spring weights on springs, but the most sort of natural interpretation and the one out of which it was derived was for population growth, but a lot of other things as well. So we have Exponential growth for small values of the population, and then we have a so we have a, a limit here. So so this piece tells us if p is small, we have exponential growth, and then here we have a limit. So as P becomes M, then the differential equation stops growing and it shrinks for P larger than M. So last time we saw, just by thinking about it, that here at P equals zero and here at P equals M, we have equilibrium solutions where have to changes and for small values, grows, but then it limits on M. So the solutions look something like this, or for values above M, they tend towards M, and maybe values are down. So we can figure this out just by analyzing the differential equation. One thing I want to emphasize, because it will be more relevant later, is we can actually encapsulate all of this information in a one-dimensional picture which says that we have nothing happening. So you think of this as a, as a movie, these dots move. Well, this dot doesn't move because as time goes on, you just sit there. If you start between 0 and M, your population increases towards M. So it starts here, and it moves up, and it limits on that. Something above M would move down, and something down there would go like that. So this is a one-dimensional version of this picture. So as I move along this curve, my population value does that. Okay. So, okay. So the, the first thing that I owe you is to actually solve this equation, which you should be able to do anyway. But I will do it for you. Okay, so we can write, so the, the logistic equation separable equation because I can get all the p's on one side and then have an integral that I can do. So I can write a formula for p. Let's use t as the variable rather than x. So I have dp dt is some constant that I don't know. Or maybe I do. It doesn't matter. It's some constant. p times 1 minus over m. So here k and m are constants. Oh, I forgot to say. m is called the carrying capacity. And so now we separate this. So we bring these guys over here over there, so we get 1 over p, 1 minus p over m, <coughs> dp is k dt. And then integrate both sides. So I'll do this one, and you can do this one. Seems fair. Um, so this tells us, this is k 
T plus some constant. And here, well, to do this integral, uh, it's not obvious just looking at it. So what would we do to do this integral? Use partial fractions, right? So we can't just look at it and see, oh, it's obviously this. We have to use partial fractions to split up the integral to see what it looks like. So we use partial fractions. Really using a lot of board space. Let me do it here. So I have 1 over p times p minus oops, 1 minus p over m. And I want to split that up as a over p plus b over 1 minus p over m. So that means that, so I'm going to use partial fractions here just to find. Okay, you can't even read that, but okay. So I want to split that up. So that means that when I cross multiply all the stuff, this means 1 is a times 1 minus p over m plus b times p. So what are the, how do I find the constants? Nobody remember how to do partial fractions? You could, you could either put the terms together and then equate coefficients. So we have one person in the room that remembers this. This does not bode well for what will happen uh, on the final. Um, so we want to find a, so how many of you don't remember how to do this? How many of you do remember how to do this? Okay, so it's just too early for you to respond. Okay, so I'm going to do it instead of by multiplying out and equating coefficients, which is the same thing. I'm going to say if p is 0, then I have 1 equals a times 1 plus 0. So a is 1. And if uh, p is m, wait a minute, b is 1 over m, some term. Is that right? Yeah. What? Yes, I know. So if p is m, then b is, I guess I ran out of room now. So if uh, P is M, then I have 1 equals uh, B times M, so that means B is 1 over M. Really? This doesn't seem right, because I'm supposed to get a negative. Did I make a mistake? Let's see what happens. So b is 1 over m. So, so that means, so my integral dp over p times 1 minus p over m becomes then uh, 1 over p integral plus uh, 1 over m. 1 minus p over m dp. Right? Oh, I see. That's where it comes from. Okay. So this is, let's, uh, so this gives me a log, and then this integral, well, let me clean it up a little bit. Uh, let's multiply through by m. And so this is the same thing. So here I make the substitution u equals m minus p. So du is minus dp. So this becomes negative the log of m minus p times m. Yeah. 
So I get minus log of n minus p. So this is log of p minus log, these are absolute values, m minus p. Right? I hope so. And so now I need to solve for that equals this. So I have the log, well actually, let's put these together. So this equals, right, since it's the log, a difference of logs, this is the log of the ratio, ln p over n minus p. And, well, okay, let's do that. So that means that I have Uh, since from over there, this integral, which is the log of p over n minus p equals kt plus c. So that's what I want to solve now. The log of p over n minus p is a constant times t plus c. So now I want to solve this for p. So I'll exponentiate both sides. And that tells me that p over m minus p is e to the kt plus a constant which I can just put in front here. Everybody okay with this so far? Now I'm going to solve this for p. So I suppose I could cross multiply and gather terms and blah 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 But it's actually easier just to swap sides. So here, if this is true, Maybe I shouldn't call this A yet. Let me leave the C up here, just for now. So if this is true, then it's also true that if I divide through by this and divide through by this, or take the inverse of both sides, I get E to the minus KT minus C is M minus P over P. And the reason I did that is because this becomes a 1 when I split it apart. Makes it a whole lot easier to solve for p. So now I can add 1 to both sides. And then I'm going to cross multiply again. I guess I should put the A there. And I did this. Okay? Yes? No? So that means that the solution to the logistic equation here, I might as well just put it here and then I don't bother with it anymore. The solution to this, you see, this is sort of like an exponential growth, but with some, some little funny term here to mess it up, the 1 plus. Because I have a negative e on the bottom, and so 1 over that is exponential for small values of t, for small values of m, 
and for large values of m, not small values of m, small values of the population and so on. Okay? So this is the formula that we have for that. I suppose I should do a problem or two using it. So the method that you do in all of these problems is sort of the same. So let's uh, So suppose I have a population of rabbits on some island. They like grass, so it has grass. And there's nothing there but rabbits. So rabbits are perfectly happy to eat grass. There's nothing but rabbits and grass. Uh, and so, um, and suppose that the island, the grass on the island can support, I don't know, one million rabbits. That's a lot of rabbits. We make it smaller. Sorry, can support a million rabbits. Uh, that's a big idea. Um, that's a lot of rabbits. Let's make it a thousand. Make it ten. Okay. So it can, it's still a lot of rabbits. It's you know, but that means that like there's no grass and they all start dying and they bite each other and all that bad stuff. They're like the rabbits in Monty Python. Um, okay, so the rabbit, it can support a million rabbits, that's the carry capacity. And uh, we start with, there's a hundred rabbits. And for this small population, over the course of the year, Let's say there's, uh, well, let's see, rabbits have typically something like uh, litter, is it litters? Rabbits have litters? I don't know. They have something like six babies at a shot, and uh, <laughs> they do this like four times a year. So they, the birth rate, so, so for each rabbit, Let's see, we have a we have a hundred. So in the in the first year, there's around two thousand rabbits are born. And let's say oh let's just say a hundred die. Well let's let's make this numbers nicer, so let's say fifty die. 2050 rabbits are born and 50 rabbits die. Well, it has to happen somewhere. Would you rather it make it be five? You can make it be five. None of them will die. They live forever. Okay. They're the, well, then you want them to never die. This would be really bad for them. Okay. Let's say they fit. Because it gets really cold there in the winter. And all the rabbits are cold. <laughs> um, okay, so now let's figure out uh, what is the population after five years. Okay, so this is a fairly straightforward problem. Can everyone do this? Is there anyone here who cannot do this? If there's no one here who cannot do this, then there's no reason for me to do it. Okay, there's at least three people who say they can't do it. Well, what's wrong with you? Haven't you been coming to class? You stupid! Oh, sorry. Um, 
Okay. So, so how do we do this? Well, first we have to figure out what these constants are. Um, I seem to be missing something. Uh, okay, I guess I need one other piece of information here, which I forgot, which I need to know still. Uh, no, I have everything. Okay. So we can use, we can estimate k from this. <laughs> Right? Because over the course of a year, uh, we get 2,000 rabbits. So that tells us, I still think I need one more thing. Um, yeah, I still need one more piece of information. Well, let's see what we see. So, so we know that P of 0 <coughs> is 100. So we have, so. I mean, you can write down the differential equation, but there it is. The differential equation is... So if we just say, what is the differential equation? Well, the differential equation here is P prime of T equals... Well, K we can read off from this. K seems to be 2,000. We can check that, but it's 2,000. 1 minus p over, was it 10,000? Yeah, over 10,000. Oh, 2,000 over 100, sorry. Right, because the growth rate, we went from 1, 100 rabbits to 2,000 rabbits. So the growth rate, so here, we can assume that the growth rate is approximately equal to k. I'm seeing a lot of blank faces. Is that just because it's morning? Do you understand where this came from? Do you understand this, where, where these numbers came from, or are you just not? You don't understand. Okay. So. Put that there for a minute. Okay. Does, do you understand where this number came from? Okay. So this is the carrying capacity. And we need to figure out what the K is. Well, we have this information here. That in the first year, notice that 100 is very small relative to 10,000. Fairly small. It's 100. Um, and so, it's going to be kind of like exponential growth at this point. And so here, the net change is plus 2,000. Right? Because uh, <coughs> no, I screwed up, didn't I? I had 150 guy, 50, that was, well, it's 2,000. Can I just change this number? It's 2,000 plus 50. It's 2,100. No. Duh. No, it's plus 2,000. Sorry. So here, in the course of the first year, the rate was plus 2,000 rabbits for every 100. So that means that the rate of change was a factor of 20. One rabbit became 20 rabbits. Right? They're magical. You cut them up and they just turn into little rabbits. They're even worse than worms that way. Um, so that would mean that this K would be about 20. Now we can do this another way. Yeah? Wouldn't the K be 21? Because um, 2,000 are born, but then you still have 100. So well, so let's, let's, let's just do it another way. So the growth rate here is a factor of 20, right? 2,100 is how many you have total. But the growth rate is a factor of 20. I'm estimating the derivative of the function here when p is small. So the derivative is I went from 100, I grew by a factor of 20. But we can do it another way. Okay, so let's do it the other way. 
So here, there's our derivative, there's our, our function, but we know that the solution of this is, we don't have to solve it again because we already know this. Negative. Where A is some constant we don't know. Now we know a couple of things. We know that, oh, M we already know. Sorry, it's 10,000. So our initial population, P of 0, tells us that 10,000 over 1 plus A, T is 0, so that's just 1 plus A, is 100. When we first started looking, there were 100 rabbits. And so this tells us the value of A. So 100 times 1 plus A is 10,000. And so uh, why can't I subtract 100 from 10,000? I don't know. What? No. 100 plus 100 A equals 10,000. I don't want to divide yet. First I want to subtract and then I want to divide. So I subtract here and this gives me uh, 9, 9, 0, 0 is 100 A. So now I divide and A is 99. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's the same, right? <laughs> I just was dividing something else. Um, so A is still 99, no matter how you do it. Uh, yeah, that was stupid. Okay, anyway, A is 99, so we have A. And then we also have the population in the first year. There are uh, 2,000 rabbits, 2050 rabbits, we had 100. 205 holes were born and we lost it. So this is uh, 2100, right? And that equals 10,000 over 1 plus 99 e to the minus kt. t is 1. And so again, we do the same solving stuff, and maybe I'll divide a little more intelligently this time, who knows. So 10, 100 over 21 is 1 plus 99 e to the minus k. Uh, so, yeah, k is positive, that's good. So, no, K should be negative. Oh, okay. So now I want to subtract one from both sides. So, uh, I really wanted that to be fun. So, uh, subtract one from both sides, so I get, uh, why can't I do this subtraction? 80, 79, right? If I subtract one from this, I get 79, no. So minus 21 over 21. Yeah, 79 over 21 times 99 is e to the minus k. And so k is the log of 21 times 99 over 79. I thought, well, so somewhere I may, I may have, right, did I do that correctly? Well, okay, so negative k is the log of 79 over 21 times 99. It's the same. So, so that's our k. So now we have everything. And so that means p of 5. I mean, this is really all just algebra. Is whatever the heck it is. 10,000 over 1 plus, 
Where's A? 99 E to the minus or plus, doesn't matter, log whatever this orbital number is. And we plug it in five. Which I don't know what this number is because when I did this in my office, I had different numbers. Uh, so, this is a stupid question now because the numbers didn't work out nice. But they are what they are. So, okay, let me. Did I make a mistake? I probably did. <laughs> Well, I didn't flip it because she complained about the negative. Right. Oh, so this is plus, right? Yeah, that looks better. Because that's a negative number, so that will shrink, so the whole thing will grow. That's better. Yeah? Oh, I don't care. Because I did it with plus here, and I did it with minus here. But A is some constant. So if you want to add it, fine. If you want to subtract it, fine. It's just a constant. So you have to solve for it, but you just have to be consistent. I started with it being plus. So I solved for it being plus, and it was 99. <laughs> Had I done it negative over here, then it would be negative 99. Okay? So, so, I mean, this is one kind of question you can ask. Another kind of question you can ask, or I can ask, one can ask, that you can be asked, is how long will it take the rabbit population to double how long will it take the rabbit population to be 800, 800, how long will it, that sort of thing. So if I ask the question, how long will it take the rabbit population to be uh, 8,000, then we would solve for t such that t of t equals 8,000. Right? So then that's the inverse problem. All of these kinds of things are fair game. You have several of these sorts of things on the homework. One thing that you need to do in these kinds of problems is read the words and understand what you are being told and what is being asked for. Sometimes these, these situations are set up where you're not told an exact population like this, but you're still told a ratio or a percentage. The percentage of this is blah, 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 blah. That means that the carrying capacity is 1, or 100 if it's percentage. So if it's a fraction, then the carrying capacity is 1, because that's the whole thing. If it's a percentage, the carrying capacity is 100, because the biggest a percentage can be is 100, and so on. So you need to read the problem, pay attention to the words. This is where most of the people in this class get burnt, is they don't read the words, and they just go, oh, too many words, my head hurts. You know how to read, I hope. Uh, all right, so let's, rather than doing another logistic problem, let me move on to another. So are we okay with this? I mean, these are really, in some sense, quite easy. Notice that once you have the formula, Calculus is now gone, right? This, this happens all the time. The difficulty with these problems is not the calculus. The difficulty is the stuff you should have learned in eighth grade. The algebra. The translation from words to symbols. Um, but, okay. Right, so, I mean, we've solved it once. We don't need to solve it again. We know the solution. I am not necessarily recommending you memorize this formula. Because we could tweak this problem. So let me point out that the goal here is not for you to know logistic equations. The goal here is to, for you to see the relationship between differential equations, separable techniques, and objects that are being modeled, such as population. So for example, on the homework, there's other ones where instead of having say something like this, there's a constant here. Or maybe there's another factor here. 
uh, I don't know, some other factor here, and so on. And you can solve all of these by exactly the same technique. Right? It's a separable equation. You write down the equation, you solve it, out comes the answer. Okay? Let me um, move away from, I'll leave that. Oh. So, let's, let's take this same situation. Let's instead, let's push away, let's take the same issue with the rabbits. But I'm, for now, I'm not going to model them as logistic equations. Let's just assume that the island has suddenly become a continent. So there's no limit to the grass. But there's wolves now. Little rabbits. Okay, so first they were happy little rabbits and they said, Look, our little island is now Australia. We have lots of grass. But then they discover that there's dingoes that will come and eat them. So this is bad. So let's think about this situation. So we have our rabbits who now have unlimited grass supply, so their growth is exponential. That means that Um, something like AE to the KT. And now we also have some wool, uh, let's use wolves. I don't think they have, we want dingoes, but then we have two Ds. So, uh, uh, so we, let's call dingoes by W, because, you know, it looks sort of in Australia, so it's like an M. And they're mean guys, and we draw them upside down. So, and so we'll use W because this is an upside down M, M for mean. Um, is there an E in Dingoes? No. So this is, yeah, this, this is the growth rate. So this, uh, this is, so if there's nothing to eat there, they grow exponentially. There's lots of grass, they're happy, 20 babies a year, just crazy times. But then, suddenly, the wolves show up, the dingoes show up. Uh-oh. Now, let's, in the absence of rabbits, there's nothing for them to eat, except possibly each other. But this means that they die exponentially. So in the absence of rabbits, they spelled absence wrong, didn't I? It's not good. In the absence of rabbits, they just die off. Because there's nothing for them to eat except possibly eat each other. So if they don't eat anything, they starve. And if they eat each other, their numbers go down. So in either case, they die off. But there's an interaction. So So I'm going to draw a picture like the one that I drew before. I'm going to suppress time. And I'm going to put the day goes here. And this is population zero. And what will happen here 
is if I give any population of dingoes, and I'm going to put rabbits this way, if I give dingoes any population, but there are no rabbits, what happens? Well, they die. Start here with a population of 1,000, and then a lot of them die, and you only have 200, and then 100, and they just die off. The rabbits, on the other hand, if there are no dingoes around, well, what happens? You get a few rabbits, then a lot of rabbits, then it goes crazy. What I want to figure out is what happens when there are both. So I want to adjust these equations to account for rabbit-wolf, inter rabbit-dingo interactions. So what will happen? We have r prime equals, uh, oops, what am I doing? I'm sorry. This was r of t. That's what you were asking. Okay. Which is the same as saying dr dt is some constant r. And this is the same. The same dw dt is some constant w. Sorry. So, so the rabbit growth rate is some constant times how many rabbits there are around. This constant here is, is negative. And the dingo growth rate is some negative constant times the number of dingoes around. But now, if there's rabbits for the dingoes to eat, then that's good for them. Uh, and it's, so this is sort of, if a rabbit meets a wolf, a rabbit meets a dingo, there's some probability that the dingo will eat the rabbit, and there's some probability it will get away. <coughs> this ratio, this is the benefit to the rabbit population of being eaten, that is negative, there are fewer rabbits, and this is the benefit to the wolf population of eating a rabbit, the dingo population. Hard for me to say W being a dingo. Um, so we have equations like this, where K, C, A, and B are all positive. Now, I'm not going to write down formula for what happens, but we can think about what will happen. So is it, is it clear that this describes something not unreasonable? People understand where these equations come from. Okay. So, so this is the growth rate when there's no things eating the rabbits, and the death rate when there's nothing for the dingoes to eat. And then this is the advantage or disadvantage of an interaction. So, what does this mean? We can interpret that there will be some stable population because we can write this as r prime, we can factor the r out. And w prime, we can factor the w out. Uh, should I do this with actual numbers instead of letters? Or are we okay with letters? Letters are good. Letters are good? Okay. So you can see that if r and w are both zero, you get an equilibrium point. The constant, there's nothing. No population changes. Because the RDT is zero, the WDT is zero, nothing changes. But if W is uh, K over A, then also there is no change in the rabbit population. 
So if the number of wolves here is k over a, then the rabbit population doesn't change. So this means at this point. And also, if the number of rabbits is C over B, there's no change in the dingo population. So right here, there's another place, namely at rabbits equals C over B, uh, dingoes equals K over A, where there's another solution where the population does not change. So we found another equilibrium solution just by solving both of these equals zero. Now, how can we figure out what else will happen? Nobody knows. Does anyone have a clue what I'm talking about? You have a clue. Good. Can we try Well, if you make them both really big, we have to think about what will happen. And if you make them both really small, it's pretty obvious what will happen. Um, so, so certainly for small values of rabbits, we can think about what will happen here. So, so you say there's a lot of dingoes and a couple of rabbits. Well, the dingoes will still continue to die off. But eventually, they will die off to hardly anything. And a lot of rabbits. So then they'll take a go this way. Right? So we have hardly any rabbits and a lot of dingoes. So what is this a graph of? This graph is telling me the ratio, this graph is telling me something about the populations, but without time. I have to put little arrows to remember what's happening over the time. How can I... So that was just... So we, we can sort of figure out that this will happen. What, what will happen over here? Well, let's think about how we can make this a little more like something we know. We can make a direction field. We can look at what will happen, what will be the slopes to the various solutions, what is the ratio of R, of the change in R to the change in W. Because, right, we can compare what the change in the rates are by looking at this. This tells me dr dt, this tells me dw dt. So if I look at the ratio, this tells me dr dw by the chain rule. So what is that telling me? So if w, right, I can, I can, is, this, is that apparent or not? I can't, I'm seeing a lot of blank eyes and I don't know whether it's just because class is over and you want me to shut up, or you really not fun. So let me just say it, and then I'll do it on Monday. What we can do is we can calculate slopes that look like that by looking at the ratio of the derivatives. The ratio of the derivatives by the chain rule is the slope of what's going on here. So I can draw little arrows here that look like that and see that for something near this, it will tend to spiral around. And so we get, we don't see the time component explicitly, but we can look at the ratio of the two and get something that will tell us how the population will change. So I'll do this on Monday, but here, 
The population will change in an oscillatory manner. 